Greetings and welcome back to room 303 in our Harvard Classics lectures. We are in lecture 13. We are in volume number four of the Harvard Classics. Uh, this one is Milton's English Poetry, is the uh, title of the volume. We saw Milton's prose in an earlier lecture in volume number three. We did Areopagitica, we did uh, his treatise or Tractatus on uh, Education. Uh, and we now turn to, Eng to Milton's English uh, Poetry. He wrote important poems in other languages other than English. That's why this distinction is being made, by the way. Especially he wrote in Latin. We think of his classic at Patrum, which was his poem to his father, where he declares that he is in fact not going to be the uh, kind of writer his father was, and the type of uh, uh, more like technical type of uh, dealing with prose, but rather he was going to become this writer, this poet. We'll have more to say about that project later. But we have to ask this question. We are in volume four. Why Milton first? This is the first poetry, by the way, that we've enjoyed in Harvard Classics. Why Milton first? For example, um, not Homer, the Iliad, the Odyssey, not Virgil, his Aeneid, not Dante's, the Divine Comedy, especially often studied the uh, Inferno. Uh, why Milton first? Now, there's a, there's a lot of been, there's been a lot of speculation on why exactly it is that Milton is the first poet to be presented, not even Shakespeare given this right. And the typical answer that's given by scholars and people like me who do this for a living is to say, Milton is pretty much considered the greatest poet in the English language, along with, of course, Chaucer and his Canterbury Tales. We've given lectures elsewhere on him, and of course, Shakespeare and Shakespeare's sonnets. Milton, I will argue, is significant because he shows us how you decide to become a writer, an artist, a poet. We're going to see this in our, in our study of his own biography. I think it's important to follow the connections, and so let's play that game in our notes really quickly. I believe that to study Milton well, you have to first of all appreciate St. Augustine's Confessions. Milton's Ad Patrum, as well as a couple of sonnets that we're going to study here just in a few moments, show us that Milton was very influenced by the idea of self-creation, of, uh, of deciding this is what I will be, in his case, a great poet, and then I'm going to do everything in my power to kind of build towards that. Now, I think there's some reasons and some motivations we'll get into for that attitude here in a little bit, but I really feel like in many ways that there's, a, there, there's really an important link between St. Augustine's Confessions and Milton's project of his poetic life, his poetic career. Milton's biographers will often see that all of the pre-paradised lost poems that had been written are kind of a preparation in many ways for him to write Paradise Lost. Of course, let's be fair, when we mention Milton, we're almost always going to mention his classic great epic poem, Paradise Lost. We'll have more to say about that. And, of course, we'll have some lectures here coming in the future on Paradise Lost for each of the books of Paradise Lost, because I really want to argue that if you ever decide to pick up any single poem in the English language and read it, I'm going to challenge you to read Paradise Lost. Not read as much today, sadly, in my estimation, but I think it I think it's going to help you tremendously to be a reader of Paradise Lost. We'll get there. Volume 4, then, of the Harvard Classics will provide Milton's English poems written in his youth, starting at age 21 with on the, uh, the morning of Christ's nativity. We'll get to it in a moment. Uh, at age 29, a few years later, his classic Lycidas, and we'll have more to say about that one, on the death of his school fellow and close comrade, Edward King, and then by age 47, so you can kind of see we're, we're, we're following the range of his life on his blindness 10 years before he finally writes Paradise Lost. Let's outline for your notes how we will study some of this poetry as we're looking at some of Milton's um, poetry before Paradise Lost. Unfortunately, we can't do all the poems. I wish we could. We can't. We, I just don't have the time. Um, we will see how Milton is evolving as person and as poet through the analysis of these poems. And we'll begin to prepare for our study of Paradise Lost. There is so much that we need to know to really appreciate Paradise Lost. And in many ways, we'll be making that list here. It is an amazing list of the things we kind of need to know as we get ready. Let's begin with Milton's poetic biography. We, in an earlier lecture, Lecture 11 in this series, we gave 
uh, the lecture, the uh, notes on Milton's political biography. Let's now concentrate on his poetic biography. And the first thing we want to say for our notes here is that he had a prodigious, amazing education. Okay, it is in many ways the keys to understanding everything about his writing and our study of Paradise Lost. Uh, he's born December the 9th in uh, in 1608. Uh, thing about that, as we said earlier, in relationship to, for example, the date 1600, which is usually given for Shakespeare's Hamlet being performed on stage. So that's kind of a working sense of where you are in the trajectory of Shakespeare and Milton. Okay, um, He has private tutors from the year 1620 to 25. He's at St. Paul's School, um, which is a really famous school, and he's there with that educational reformer, Alexander Gill. Um, and then after that, he's at Christ College in Cambridge. Uh, from 1625 to 1632. Those are important years for him, though, as we said in an earlier lecture, there seems to be some discussion about how well he fit in in that kind of context, in that setting. Um, he is a linguistic polymath, though, during that time. I mean, he learns Latin, he learns Greek, he learns Italian. He writes poetry in all of these languages and even others as well. Okay. In some of his early school exercises, what's often referred to as his, uh, his, as his juvenilia, he, he practiced he practices writing poetry in those early school books, and that's kind of that's kind of interesting. And then he lives at home in that studious retirement from 1632 to 38, um, and he basically tries to read everything he can read. He has, as well, this amazing memory, and we want to underscore this. He not only reads the stuff, he has tremendous memory capacity so that he can remember the things that he read. I mean, wouldn't this be cool if you could remember everything that you've read while you've been in school and outside of school? Right. We define in 303, remember, learning as the ability to connect new information to old information. Can you underscore this in your notes right now? Milton is the penultimate example of this for us. He will show us, he will demonstrate for us what great learning is all about by virtue of, and again, learning here, the ability to connect new information to old information. His allusions, A-L-L-U-S-I-O-N-S, his references to other classic texts in Paradise Lost is is going to prove this right away, but it's also, we're going to see this in Lycidas, we're going to see this in others of his poems, all right? Um, he reads the Bible, of course, in his youth, in the original languages of Hebrew, Greek, as well as, of course, Aramaic and Syriac. So he is a, as we say, polymath. That is to say, he's, he, his, his knowledge is amazing. But I like to say it this way. He doesn't just have talent. He has that other thing that makes great students. He has a sense of curiosity, a sense of wonder. For example, he wants to travel, so he goes to Italy in the late 1630s. There, he apparently meets the aging, the aging Galileo, who was under house arrest by the Inquisition, of course, for you know um, making observations that are scientific in nature. He begins this thing called a commonplace book, and you can Google this and do your own research on this, where he begins to kind of add up all the quotes that he loves. And of course, many of these are going to end up in his poetry, especially Paradise Lost. All of this study, along with his amazing memory, contributes and culminates in Paradise Lost. Everything kind of points to it in some ways. Okay. Now I'd like to pause for a moment and in your notes I'd like to give you three important ideas that I think are important to understanding Milton's stuff. And by the way, so many people have commented on Milton and I stand obviously on the shoulders of unbelievable giants as I give lecture on Milton like this. And again, I'm only going to scratch at the epidermis of what we're talking about. We talk about Milton. I mean, if you're serious about your study, obviously you want to go on and spend time with serious experts who really have spent a lot of time with Milton and his, and his stuff. But for me, as I'm presenting information to you, I will say there's kind of three things to me that have always been important when I talk about Milton. And I love to talk about Milton. I mean, he's one of the writers and poets that I love most to talk about. The first thing if I want to talk about Milton with anybody, I always will mention the fact that fundamentally you have to appreciate that Milton is a believing Christian. This is huge to understand. There is a passage in the New Testament for Milton that I believe is foundational to understanding everything about his life. Matthew 25, 14 through 30, it's called often the parable of the talents. Let's tell it quickly. In the story that Jesus tells, a father who is very wealthy leaves his three boys with some money. Okay? To the first boy, he leaves what we will call 10 grand. To the second boy, he leaves 5 grand, half the amount. And to the last boy, he leaves 1,000 bones. All right? And he goes away. When he comes back, his question to all three of his sons is, What have you done with my money? The first son, the oldest, comes in and he says, Hey, you gave me 10 grand. I made a million bucks off of it. High five. The father says, Good job. 
to the second boy, he says, well, you only gave me five grand, but I, I made half a million dollars. I mean, I didn't make as much as my older brother, but then I didn't start with as much either, did I? Um, but I made some money, and again, the father, high five, nice job. The third bro, who only got $1,000, comes in front of his dad, and he says, here's the deal. I was afraid. I didn't have much, and I didn't want to lose what you gave to me. So I, I just dug a, a hole in the ground. I stuck the, I stuck the bones in the ground. I come back. Now, here's your money. Interestingly in this story, the father is irate with the youngest son. He cannot believe he's ready to disown. And in fact, in the story, there's a reading that says he ultimately does disown. In other words, what does this story say? Now, here's an example. Classic Milton. Every kid in Milton's class knew this story. By the way, when the text is translated in the 1611 King James Version of the Bible, the word for money is talents, as in talents of gold, coinage. But of course, you can quickly see how this story becomes a story about the use of talent. Milton knows this story well, and he believes this story. Let's underscore that. He believes the story. Well, what is the story really telling Milton? It says, the more talent you have, the greater the responsibility placed upon you. And in my reading of Milton's life, I believe this story is central. Milton knew from a young age that he had prodigious abilities. He knew then that he was expected to do something great with that talent. Well, what does that mean? Number two, I think because of this, God demands more of me, Milton thinks, than normal people because I'm not a normal guy. I'm not a normal kid. I mean, I have abilities that other kids don't have. Therefore, I can't be conceited about that. There's more responsibility on me now. Number two, I believe to understand Milton, you have to understand his prodigious ambition. Okay? He decides, for example, to leave the work of his father. He's not going to do that work at all writing out legal tracts and that kind of thing. And in his classic Latin poem, Ed Patrum, he actually comes out and seems to say, uh, Dad, I love you, but i got to go my own way. He decides, watch this, in his ambition. I mean, every school child will have read Homer, the Iliad, the Odyssey, but Milton reads the Iliad, the Odyssey, and says, I think I can write a better poem. Well, reads Virgil's Aeneid, but then Milton will say, I think I can write a better poem, or a poem at least to write it if not a better poem. He reads Dante, and of course the Italian Catholic, greatest Italian Catholic poem, and he says, I think the Divine Comedy, and he says, I think I can, I think I can do something like that. Only he's going to do it, obviously, for his Protestant Christian theology. Or for example, Shakespeare. I mean, we're going to see a poem that, you know, he, he loves Shakespeare, but already he's beginning to wonder, can I be a dramatic poet? Can I write a poem that is dramatically as powerful as anything Shakespeare has done. Again, it's one thing to love great literature and great writers. It's another thing to imagine, to hope, to equal, or even to supersede, to impress, to go beyond those greatest of writers. That's what I mean by ambition. Finally, number three. He decides he wants to write the Protestant ethic of all, uh, epics of all epics, right? But, and this is, the, this is the third thing in his biography that I think you have to write down. February, there's some debate about this, but roughly around February 1652, at the age of 44, Milton starts to go blind. Here is a man whose whole life is dedicated to reading and to writing. And he has this unbelievable ambition, and he believes, deeply believes, that God has put him on this planet to write and to do something really important, and then he starts going blind. In 1652, at the age of 44, 1658, at the age of 50, when he is blind, he will produce the greatest poem in the English language, Paradise Lost. Now, whether it's the greatest poem in the English language or not, we have to debate, but you can only do that once you've read it. Does that make sense? But before we read Paradise Lost, we want to spend a little bit of time looking at some of Milton's poems that are part of that pre-Paradise Lost period when he was writing poetry. So this is what we're going to do now. Okay? We want to turn to, to the poems in Harvard Classics that we, will, that we will study. I can't again do all of them. I apologize. But what we want to do is we want to turn to some of these poems and we want to pay attention to them. 
Um, I, I love to read Milton's poetry, and so please forgive me if, if it's all right. I'm going to read some of this stuff out loud. Um, let's just take a look at some of these poems of Milton's. We'll begin, and we'll kind of work chronologically through, since that's the way they're, they're uh, listed. The, um, the opening ones are the poems of John Milton written at school and college from 1624 to 1632. And the very first one is called On the Morning of Christ's Nativity from 1629 when he's 21 years old. I love to work with this one because it is at 21, which is just a few years older than you guys, right? And already we are beginning to see Milton dreaming of the birth of not only Christ, but possibly a poetic voice that will become Milton the poet. I'm just going to read the poem, and we're going to note all of the early ideas that can ultimately lead to Paradise Lost, ideas like the juxtaposition between light and darkness, um, the idea of Christ as Savior, and some of those other kinds of things that will factor majorly into our study of Paradise Lost. Let's just read it. By the way, you don't have to have Harvard Classics to read this. You can go online and find this poem easy again on the morning of Christ's nativity. And then you can read along with me. I hope you'll do that. This is the month, and this is the happy morn. Wherein the Son of Heaven's eternal King, of wedded maid and virgin mother born, our great redemption from above did bring. For so the holy sages once did sing, that he, our deadly forfeit, should release, and with his Father work us a perpetual peace. Opening lines of Paradise Lost will echo some of the same thing about man's first disobedience and the fruit of that forbidden tree and all of that. That glorious form, back to the poem, that glorious form, that light insufferable, and that far-beaming blaze of majesty wherewith he wanted heaven's high council table to sit, the midst of trinal unity. He laid aside, and here, with us to be, forsook the courts of everlasting day, and chose with us a darksome house of mortal clay. Say, heavenly muse. Now let's just pause for a moment. We're going to see this in several of Milton's poems. He, following the tradition of the Greek poets, will feel obligated to invoke the muse, to ask the muse, can you please help me to tell the song, to tell the story? Say, heavenly muse, shall not thy sacred vein afford a present to the infant king? What shall we produce for the child, infant God, Jesus? Hast thou no verse no hymn or solemn strain to welcome him to this his new abode? Now while the heaven by the sun's team untrod hath took no print of the approaching nights, and all the spangled hosts keep watch in squadrons bright. In other words, the angels are singing. Where's the poem to celebrate? You now notice there's a subtle shift here. Seems to suggest that maybe Milton himself is talking about another kind of birth. Is it possibly his own poetic verse and his own poetic voice? See, back to the poem, how from far upon the eastern road the star-led wizards haste with odor sweet the magi. Or run, prevent them with thy humble ode and lay it lowly at his blessed feet. Have thou the honor first thy Lord to greet and join thy voice unto the angel choir from out his secret altar touched with hollowed fire. Hollowed fire, the idea that there's a passion that Milton has at the age of 21. Remember, we're a long ways away. We're 30 years away from Paradise Lost being written, and yet already we can begin to get a sense that maybe Milton is headed in the direction of wanting to do something great. Briefly, I'll point out that one of the things that he did when he was quite young at 16, in the year 1624, is that he paraphrased psalms out of the Bible. Now, of course, he could do this because of his reading in, in Hebrew. One of the psalms that he paraphrases, uh, we're going to look at two, um, is uh, Psalm 114. Um, his, his, uh, his translation, his paraphrase is wonderful, so I'm going to go ahead and, and work with a few lines here. When the blessed seed of Terah's faithful son, after long toil their liberty had won, and passed from paraffin fields to Canaan land, led by the strength of the Almighty's hand, Jehovah's wonders were in Israel shown. His praise and glory was in Israel known, and on it goes. It's a, it's, it's a, beautiful, it's a beautiful paraphrase. Or uh, the 136th Psalm, that his, uh, his steadfast love endures forever, his mercies endure forever, uh, passage that if you, if you grew up reading the Psalms in, 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 out of the Bible at all, you, you probably have heard this one. It resonates with an echoing back and forth kind of uh, reading. Um, let's read some of the opening lines of this. I love this stuff, so let's just read it. Hear the beauty of the language. 
Let us with gladsome mind praise the Lord, for he is kind. For his mercies I endure, ever faithful, ever sure. Let us blaze his name abroad, for of God's he is the God. For his mercies I endure, ever faithful, ever sure. Oh, let us praises tell, that doth the wrathful tyrants quell. Uh, for his mercies a endure, ever faithful, ever sure. That with his miracles doth make amazed heaven and earth to shake. For his mercies I endure, ever faithful, ever sure. That by his wisdom did create the painted heaven so full of state. For his mercies I endure, ever faithful, ever sure. And on and on it goes. Again, if, I, one of the reasons why I give these lectures, guys, is so that you will go and look at them on your own and be just as blown away, I hope, as I have been when I look at some of this stuff. Uh, the next uh, poem that we'll take a look at, and again, I'm skipping over a number of poems, and I feel, I feel it's terrible to do it, but I've got to do it just because I don't have a lot of time. How about his, um, his famous poem on Shakespeare? Let's take a look at this one. Um, written at 22 years old in 1630. Now, there's some interesting things to be said about this poem. This is a tribute poem to Shakespeare, no question. But it also seems to as well be a poem about the greatness of poets and the importance of poets. Of course, we talk about Shelley's defense of poetry and the importance of poetry as he understands it some 200 years later. Let's go ahead and point out right now, for your notes, that you can't really have some of those great English romantic poets, we think of Keats, I just mentioned Shelley, without understanding the influence that Milton had on those guys. I mean, especially John Keats. Here is his tribute poem on Shakespeare. What need my Shakespeare for his honored bones, the labor of an age in pilot stones. In other words, Shakespeare doesn't need any monuments to be famous, right?